I'll briefly start off like with the motivation, like why are we doing this in the first place? I'll give a brief overview of the Anaconda platform just to make sure we're all on the same page. And then like um, show like what is our distribution, like um, how, how do we build it, how do we deploy it, and um, what's part of it. And then um, kind of conclude with some lessons learned and um, a sort of wish list like of things that like Conda or Anaconda could provide that would help us um, um, to do our, um, yeah, for our purposes. So um, Bloomberg, like you might have heard uh, of the company like a lot in, in relation like to uh, media, like Bloomberg News or Bloomberg Radio. But um, overall, Bloomberg is like first and foremost a data company, and like the, the news um, is like one part of that. But another big part is um, market data, and so this is basically what drives our. Um, our business. This is like the, this is what what customers are paying us for to provide them with all the data that they need to like make investment decisions. And so you can imagine that there are many teams within the company that, uh, in some way or another, like work with data to like augment it, ingest it into our systems, um, analyze it to provide like some customer analytics to our uh, customers. And um, and therefore, what we felt was that like we need kind of a um, modern uh, platform for the company, uh, like a, a streamlined way in which people can do the data science. So that not every, every single team has to like come up with their own kind of distribution, figure out what packages and environments they need, um, et cetera. And like um, also one of the goals is a bit like to kind of like, um, I've put it here, like replace Excel with Jupyter Notebooks. Um, I mean, Excel is uh, certainly nice for like some workflows, uh, maybe not so, not so nice for others. And like we try to just like also get the idea of um, that there's more than Excel out into um, um, several of our teams, and maybe also um, if like those are client-facing teams, they can also like um, get that idea out, um, further out into um, the world. And um, at Bloomberg, we are in kind of a unique position here, like with all the um, data and services that the company already provides, and now if we combine those. Um, data and services with like the open source Python scientific section, we have like a really powerful um, combination. So, what are the requirements for for us? Um, so, what's what's interesting, or maybe maybe what sets us a bit apart um, at this point is that we are like mostly concerned about Windows, and that we are concerned about deployment to the desktop. And the reason for this is that. Basically, all um, this is kind of the way that Bloomberg at the moment works. <laughs> um, so you have you have the, you have the Bloomberg terminal, which is like our um, main product, and this is what all the data is um, is coming through. And and so um, basically, all those teams they already have um, set up. Um, they are like either they, they they have their data that they are interested in already on their desktop, or they have like set up their um, connectivity on the desktop to to get their data. And so. Um, uh, we think it's probably the uh, highest uh, value that we can, can provide right now if, if we target the desktop. Um, another um, important aspect is that we want to support only like a limited combination of um, packages. And kind of what I mean with that is that um, several of the um, teams are kind of not there, they're not necessarily software engineers, um, but um, and, and maybe not, not as tech savvy as um, our team. And so if they have like uh, a problem with like um, the platform, they might come to us, right? Like if they have uh, like pandas is showing them an error, they might come to us and ask us like what's going on. And so it's much easier for us to uh, provide support if like uh, we kind of already know what's um, in the platform and not like, like maybe they have like a different version of pandas that we think they have. And, um, and then, um, the other two items I have here is like uh, reproducible runtime environments. So the idea is that, um, and that goes a bit hand in hand with like the um, uh, fifth point, facilitate sharing of projects. Is that like if I share a Jupyter notebook with someone else, then that Jupyter notebook should run just fine for 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 that other person as well on 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 their desktop. And um, so um, at least some of these items are very similar to uh, what Anaconda already provides. So I also want to highlight like the differences a bit. And so, um, obviously, you have like a different set of um, standard packages that are interesting for the financial domain. Um, like, for example, um, I hope that none of uh, our teams will need to make use of a package like AstroPy. Um, and 
Uh, the other part is that we want to kind of automate the management of packages and environments. Like, I, I don't want anybody like, to have to think of like, what package they might need, what environments um, they might need to set up. And so like, the ideal world is basically you share a notebook with someone, they click it, and it pops up, and that's it. And, and, and it works, it runs, they can run the code in it. Um, and, um, and then, um, and, and ideally this works also like six months from now. So um, we might need to like uh, update like a stable environment uh, with like security fixes for example, and, um, but otherwise keep the environment stable and backwards compatible. Okay, so uh, quickly going through the Anaconda platform. Um, I don't think I need to spend too much time on this, but like, um, um, so the Anaconda platform is basically made of, uh, out of like three major parts, I would say. Um, so, so there's Conda, which is like a cross-platform package manager. Um, and then there's Anaconda, which is basically consists of the package manager plus a bunch of um, kind of pre-built packages. And so if you download Anaconda, you get um, a, a nice set of packages plus Conda if you want to install more. And then there's Anaconda Cloud um, to share notebooks and environments and packages with, with other users. And so what we um, mostly uh, leverage is the Conda package manager at this point. And so kind of in a, in a nutshell, what the Conda package looks like is it's, it's, it's uh, like all Conda packages are tarballs, so they have like this tar.bc2 extension, and then they're identified by a name, by a version number, and by a build string that like, specifies, for example, in this case, that this was built against Python 3.5 as opposed to like another Python version. And then what's inside the package is basically just a set of files that get installed, plus some metadata, um, like the dependencies of the package. Now, how do, we, how, how do we create such a package? There's a tool called Conda Build, uh, which builds packages from, from recipes. A recipe is meant as a kind of a reproducible, um, like, like a description of how to create a, an, an environment in which we can like, build the, um, the package. So um, it contains things like um, the name and version of the package that we're gonna build, and then the dependencies needed to build. So for example, if you have a Python package, you'll probably need to run um, setup.py um, to, to like, install it um, and to, to like, make it create the files that you want to package up. And so you need Python and setup tools for that. And then there's a build script which actually like, runs the build, which is like, in a simple case, just Python setup.py, but in more complex cases can like, invoke running C compilers and, and things like that. And then kind of Conda build kind of takes care of the rest from, from, from this point onward. Um, okay, and so now before I jump to um, our distribution, I also want to quickly mention Conda Forge. So um, Conda Forge is a community-driven effort to provide uh, recipes and also build infrastructure. And the basic idea is that you have like one Git repository, which they call like a feedstock for every recipe, and then um, each, each of these recipes gets built by the infrastructure. And the nice thing about this is that like you can access this, um, this set of Conda Forge packages through a separate channel. And the channel just like tells Conda like a source where to look for packages. By default, it looks like for Anaconda packages, but you can also tell it to go to Conda Forge instead, or in addition to the default packages. And then you can like kind of mix and match packages that are available in Anaconda and Conda Forge. And there are many packages that are like, for example, especially of like smaller, less well-known um, libraries that are only available in Conda Forge and not so much in um, Anaconda. But also the other way around, the packages that are only in Anaconda. Like, for example, the Windows version of SciPy, I don't think is available in Conda Forge right now. Now, so given all these um, tools, how do we like put, put together um, them to like a, a kind of um, distribution that uh, we can ship? And like kind of the, the, the central part is like the package manifest. And what this is, is basically just a list of all the packages that are part of the distribution. And um, the package manifest is like constructed from like what's here on the right-hand side, um, what I call intended manifest. And it's just the packages that we want um, inside this distribution. Um, so in this case, for example, you have Python 3.5 and Pandas, and then in the real one, there are, of course, a bunch of others. But it's um, safe for the sake of argument with those two for now. And then we run like the, pack, the Conda dependency solver on this, on this list, and it, it actually resolves these specifications to a set of actual packages. So in this case, we have like a, a certain version of Python, just 3.5.2, and then build number one. And then we also have Pandas, but we see that also NumPy got included because it's a dependency of Pandas. And um, 
the nice thing about this locked manifest is now that all the packages are uh, completely specified. So this is the thing I can share to others, and they get like the exact same packages in their, in their system. Um, and in, in a way, this is a bit of a similar idea that what people are using in Rust, um, which like I've heard that is very well uh, thought out. Um, like this idea between like you have like a set of intended packages, and then you go from there to something that's locked down, and that's what you actually distribute to others. <clears throat> Um, versioning is, um, so, so we have now this list of packages, but like over time you want to update these packages, right? Like, it's, like we want to update like a new version of Python, a new version of Pandas, and so we assign a version number to each of these manifests. Um, and the idea basically is that we have like um, a kind of semantic version number, something like for example uh, 2.0, and then like in, um, if we make like a backwards compatible change, like let's say we fix a security issue and like update OpenSSL inside the distribution. Then, and, but like otherwise, we expect that all notebooks that have been running with like 2.0 can also still run with 2.1. Then we like release that as 2.1. If on the other hand we make a backwards incompatible change, and um, like let's say update um, from Python 2 to Python 3, for example, then we make a new major version of the manifest and go from there. And um, each of these uh, major 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 versions are like parallel installable. So you can have, like, for example, a notebook that's running against distribution two, or one that's running against di uh, distribution three. Uh, the only question then is, like, how do we select which version to pick? And the basic uh, workflow is that, like, you have some user action that, like, in, in in some ways, like, basically opening a notebook or creating a new notebook, and then we need to determine the uh, major version that we want to run this with, which for a new notebook would, like, if there's no other User input would just be like the latest uh, supported major version. Excuse me. And when it's an existing notebook, then we would use the same major version that the notebook was originally created with, because this is the version that the author of the notebook has um, confirmed that, like, has tested the notebook with and confirmed that it's working properly to, um, to their extent. And then we find the latest minor version for this major version, so that we get like the latest like security updates and maybe other uh, fixes. Um, to, to um, um, accommodate other ch um, changes, for example, in, in, our, in our backends or so. Um, and then maybe we need to create a new environment with that version. Maybe one exists already because we found a notebook before. We launch a notebook server in that environment, and we can open the um, notebook file in that um, notebook server. And then there are some other uh, extra actions to like deprecate a major version or upgrade an existing notebook. Uh, for example, from version two to version three, the only thing you need to basically do is to run it inside a different environment. Um, but then, like, it, it should always be conscious action such that uh, if you do that, you should make sure that the um, notebook is still working in the new environment, or you might need, some, need to make some changes. Um, so now we have all these different um, environments that we have maybe created, and the question is like, how do we um, avoid an kind of excessive um, set of environments on the, on, on, the, on the client computer, on the desktop. And the ob basic observation is that we're only ever running the latest minor version of a given major version. So we might still be running 2.0 uh, with a notebook that was opened like maybe a week ago, but as soon as like they close that notebook, uh, from that point on, we're only, only ever gonna use 2.1. And so basically we can kind of delete all the versions that are not the latest version of a given minor version. <clears throat> um, Okay, so this is how we um, set up this, this distribution, and like we have packages in the distribution that are like um, coming from the open source um, Python ecosystem. There are also some Bloomberg specific packages, like for example, to access um, Bloomberg market data. And um, in order to build this system, we uh, uh, have been pretty much inspired by Conda Forge. So basically, uh, these feedstock repositories that are separate from the upstream code. And then we have set up our continuous integration with a tool called BuildBot that's very similar to Jenkins, but a bit like more uh, driven by um, Python rather than UI. Um, and so the basic workflow is you make a PR on a feedstock repo, like for example, changing, um, uh, bumping a version number. Um, it gets built. And then um, even before you merge the pull request, it gets uploaded to a separate channel that only contains this new package. And then you can like kind of um, add that channel to your to your Conda installation and try, try the package out, see if it's doing what you think it should, and then merge the pull request, and it gets um, integrated into the main Bloomberg channel. Um, 
Another point um, where we need to build our own packages is when we need to customize an already existing package. Uh, one example is matplotlib. Um, the matplotlib conda package depends on Qt, which is like a desktop um, AM widget toolkit. And the thing with Qt is that it's pretty big. Um, and we want to kind of uh, need to limit the amount of um, data that we ship down or the, the number of packages that we uh, bring down to the desktop so that we can kind of bring them up fairly quickly. Um, and Qt is just not needed when we kind of focus on a Jupyter notebook based environment. And um, at, this, at this point, um, there's now kind of no notion of optional dependencies in, in Conda. And so uh, what we're doing is we're forking basically the um, matplotlib feedstock repository on Conda Forge, modified such that it doesn't need Qt, and um, then add like this feature no Qt to the build. And basically what this does is it just changes the uh, created package name. It adds this no Qt blurb into the build string, and that makes sure that um, the package gets like its unique identifier and isn't confused with any matplotlib package that, that's out there. And so if we have like all our packages that we built, they, get, they end up in this dev channel. This is where we can like try them out. Um, like right when we, when we merge a pull request, it ends up there. And then at the point where we actually bring it out um, to, to like people outside of our team to use, they use like this um, uh, kind of a copy of the dev, chan of the dev channel, which um, is a pro channel, which is like a separate um, corner channel. And, um, and the, the idea is basically just that um, we have like a script that can like propagate a um, manifest version from the dev channel to the pro channel. So for example, you have well, 2.0, which is right now only available in a dev channel. You bring that into prod, and like all the yellow packages that are dependencies of it that are part of the 2.0 manifest would kind of be migrated as well. Um, so this is the basic idea. Now let me quickly go through some like things that we've um, learned, especially with um, so mixing packages between Conda Forge and Anaconda. And um, so there's one um, package BQplot, which is a um, a data visualization package that was actually um, uh, has uh, originated uh, from within Bloomberg and got um, open sourced, um, I think, more than a year ago. And so Conda For um, uh, it's available on Conda Forge. And BQplot has a dependency on another package called IPy widgets, which is for um, which are like some basic user in interaction widgets for the Jupyter notebook. And so and so. Um, BQplot is dependent on IPy widgets, and like I only kind of, um, like it has other dependencies as well, but I kind of just draw this one out here. And so the IPy widgets uh, package is available in Conda Forge, but it's also available in Anaconda. And in, in, in Anaconda, it has another dependency on like a package that um, basically adds some um, notebook customization um, for um, Conda specific notebook customization to it. And there is a uh, um, circular dependency between IPy widgets and, and this um, extra package. And that trips up the, um, inst the the order. Like so, for example, um, if you install that BQplot package, it would install all its dependencies. And normally, it would do that like in the order, um, in like topological order, one after like uh, as the dependencies go. But due to this circular dependency, it kind of cannot do that. It has to install like one of them first and then the other. And um, BQplot has like a, a script that runs after installation that relies on IPy widgets existing, but due to this circular dependency, it might not, um, it, Conda might choose to install BQplot first and then IPy widgets, and then the installation would, 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 um, would, would break. And then it's, it's a bit hard to um, kind of pin down where exactly um, um, the issue is with this. Like you could say like oh, that's in, maybe, maybe BQplot shouldn't like have such a post install script because they're kind of um, discouraged on the Conda side. On the other hand, you could say the circular dependency is maybe a bit weird, um, but our workaround for now is basically just to prefer Conda Forge over Anaconda, and so that we pick up this um, IPy widgets dependency from Conda Forge instead. Um, another lesson that we learned is like a, a, a very similar, in the sense that, in the sense that, um, again, it's like between like um, the interplay between Conda Forge and Anaconda. There's a package called mpmath, which is available in Anaconda, and it depends on Python. And like, kind of suddenly, like, basically from one day to another, it also became available in Conda Forge. So basically, the Conda Forge community has made up their own, um, has created their own recipe for it, and made it available. But in Conda Forge, it has some additional dependencies on these like math libraries that 
maybe in the Anaconda version are kind of just like statically linked. And so now, um, suddenly, because we prefer ConduForge over Anaconda, we pick up the package from ConduForge instead. And um, that means that the, um, our build now fails because there's these additional dependencies that are not part of our manifest. And so um, ideally, we could um, not only pin like, you know, the name and version number and build string for these packages, but we could also pin the channel. But um, this is not um, what we can do right now, I think. And so the workaround is kind of to just take the package from Anaconda, upload it to our own channel, where also all the other packages that we build ourselves go. And then the kind of ultimate channel priority is like first our own packages, then kind of forge then Anaconda. Okay, and then I have one more about reproducible builds. And so um, I, I, I want to make it the point that um, like reproducible environments is uh, very important, and not only for the, for runtime, like when you ship a Python distribution, but also for for build time when you build a Python package. And um, it's kind of hard to enforce those uh, build time dependencies to particular versions. And so a build that kind of might work today might break tomorrow if, like for example, the build depends on Python, and like today I get Python 3.5.2, and tomorrow I get Python 3.5.3 because that version suddenly became available and. For some reason, my build script made some weird um, assumption on the exact Python version. And so a possible solution to this, and it's just like an idea I want to throw out there, is again to have this idea between like an intended manifest and like a fixed manifest that I like, when I know that the build worked with one particular set of dependencies, I just might kind of redo it all the time with those dependencies until I kind of explicitly go and say I want to update them now. Um, and this brings me kind of to, um, my last couple slides about like kind of a wish list of um, things that um, uh, we might uh, benefit from, and so one is like kind of a conda download command uh, that like I think this has been this has been like um, around a lot, so I don't want to talk much about it. But basically, the idea is you can that you can download some packages without um, actually installing them, and you can kind of work around that by just installing them and then uninstalling it again, and then the packages are on your on your computer. And this is requested many times already before, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, it would help us a lot in kind of working around this uh, build dependency pinning um, issue. Um, and then, like, the other big thing that uh, would help us is kind of optimizing the install time of the very first environment. If you bring, like, if you bring down the very first environment, um, this is where, um, like, basically, I share a notebook with you. You don't have used Jupyter before. And then we need to bring down the whole environment to your desktop. And so if we could like kind of speed up that process a bit, um, that would be great. And like I have like kind of two suggestions maybe what we can do. One is like um, basically what, what Conda does when it installs an environment is first downloads the packages, like the tarballs, then it extracts the tarballs, and then it installs the packages. And the first two steps are kind of like the first is mostly network I.O. bound, like downloading the stuff, and then extracting the tarballs is probably CPU bound by like decompre the decompressor. And so you could kind of like parallelize it. Like while you would download package, like the second package, you would start already start expecting the first. And um, and then one more is um, again like for kind of improving that that initial setup time. Uh, if instead like corner packages right now are bzip2 compressed, there's another uh, compression format called uh, LZMA with like the XC extension. And I just have like a quick example here uh, for like one very big package, the MKL on on Windows. Um, and the nice thing about XE is that both the compression ratio, so the download time that you would actually end up downloading the package, and the decompression speed for extraction are both better than bzip2. Um, so I also just want to throw out this as an idea. Um, if you want to, and I'm, this is something that we as uh, a company I would um, maybe also think that we can maybe contribute to Conda, so I'm happy to um, talk through with some of you uh, about those. And um, this brings me to my conclusions. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that the Anaconda platform, together with Conda Forge, is a great ecosystem for creating um, Python distributions. We build our own distributions um, based on, on, on top of these. Um, and then, um, kind of one important point I want to um, make, in, make in this presentation is that like, this idea of like, pinning, as, uh, having like, an intended set of packages versus pinning it, uh, like a frozen list of dependencies, is, 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 is a great idea that should probably be um, people to think about a bit more. Thank you. Thanks very much, Armin.
Uh, we've got time for a few questions. Is there any questions in the audience today? I've got bright lights in my face, so. Derek's, Derek's got you. I, what, what is the vision for uh, distributing the notebooks to Bloomberg cluster customers? This is... Um, so is the question why we do not distribute the notebooks to customers? No, I, are, are you intending to or do you have oh, a, okay. a view um, on the vision of how Right. Uh, Bloomberg clients will be able to inter interface with notebooks. Um, uh, so that's a very good question, and that's like also one thing that we've um, we have thought about a lot and are considering. Um, for for right now, we are concentrating on internal uh, users, also to get a bit of kind of a feedback uh, from them and see how this whole thing goes. And I don't want to say we are never. I don't want to say we are never gonna like um, also bring this in front of customers. And I think there's like. Um, as I said in the beginning, there's like lots of value that we can provide, like combining all the Bloomberg data with um, the open um, science distributions. Um, but f at the moment, um, that's not our focus. Other questions? Hi. Um, I know it's quite common in a lot of companies, um, like especially the big ones that have uh, most of their people running on Windows already to have a split sort of world where they'll have sort of interactive stuff going on on Windows, but then be deploying to Linux. And I'm wondering if you guys are doing that uh, and what your experience has been using this kind of distribution control as far as getting equivalent environments on different platforms. Um, so that's... Um So basically, we've, we've started to look at um, Linux as well. So basically, we have come up with like a similar kind of set of packages that we could install on Linux instead of Windows. And um, most of the notebooks that like we kind of interact with daily um, ran, run just fine on, on Linux as well. Um, but like the, the, the kind of the big point point is getting the, um, getting the Bloomberg data. Because that, that right now is, is just like so interwoven with kind of like the, the terminal. And like you having a, um, um, like the thing is it needs to somehow authenticate you. And like if you're logged into the terminal, that's how it works. If you're on Linux and you don't have a terminal running there, you need to kind of somehow authenticate in a different way. And there are ways to do that, but um, it's just not so straightforward. <laughs>